Hello everyone and welcome to Fist Chat, the vodcast that features discussions on the topics of film, science and technology. My name is Ben Warner and I'm joined once again by my good friend and colleague Steve Kern. How are we today, Steve? I'm good, thanks Ben. Hi Fist Chat fans. Uh, yes, we've got some big topics today, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, sort of a transition from the old guard to the new in some respect, hopefully. Uh, but before we get into that, don't forget our uh, website, www.fistchat.com. You can get all our links there. You can subscribe to our audio via iTunes, SoundCloud and our RSS feeds. You can catch our videos on YouTube, Vimeo and Digicosm TV. Uh, you can interact with us on Twitter, Google Plus and Facebook. Love to hear from you. We've got our ebook, The Fist Report at fistreport.com, only 99 cents. Uh, very cool read. I'm must say and uh, well you know it's coming from us after all <laughs> uh you can get that on amazon uh, all uh, nice and good for your kindle um there's also our supplementary content the weekly blogs photography on instagram and Flickr, and uh, recommend us to anyone who you think may be interested in our weekly discussions on film science and technology now uh the sydney harbour bridge made headlines this week um uh, our iconic um sort of uh structure probably along with the opera house that the the whole world knows about uh now it was built 80 years ago um and although it's stood the test of time and it still seems to be going well it's becoming a very expensive uh, proposition to uh, keep maintaining it uh and um an ex-politician ross cameron um he used to be in the House of Reps. He's really been uh, get, he's been getting onto TV lately and sort of spruiking the case of actually replacing the Harbour Bridge with an uh, with with an exact replica, looks wise, but is fundamentally different in terms of the materials that it's made out of, etc. Uh, before um, we get into the bridge itself, I just wanted to maybe Steve, if you can uh, help take us through this, the science of why this is required. And he also uh, Ross Cameron in his uh, piece for the ABC also said this. Um, you know, he, he said, he, oh, I must have missed the chemistry lecture that explained in the early 20th century, Sydney alchemists invented a form of steel that doesn't rust or oxidize and will last forever. <laughs> Everything you can see is perishing, including the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So do, do you ever uh, take us through what that actually means in, in a little bit more detail? Well, yeah, it, look, it principally goes back to the fact that the Sydney Harbour Bridge was the best bridge they could build in mm. the 1930s. And that's, that's essentially it. It's made out of stone. It's made out of iron. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't build that bridge like that today. You know, uh, that's how different technology is. So the bridge constantly needs to be painted. Uh, you know, it's made out of rivets. It It is... It is very old-fashioned and I think this is principally why, what he's saying is that you would rebuild it today. You wouldn't use rivets in the way that they have. They use the hot rivets to uh, to basically, you know, staple the, the bridge into place. Mm. Um, and you, you wouldn't use, I guess, um, you just wouldn't make it like it is. I mean, the bridge weighs a massive amount because mm. they didn't have lightweight materials or any of the uh, technology uh, or advances in engineering they have today. And given where uh, it's it's located, weather condition wise, there's a, you know a body of water, obviously that it's uh, helping us to sort of cross um, two two pieces of land. All all of all of those uh, weather conditions have really got to buffet the, um, the the structure and the materials involved. You know, rusting, etc. So it must be a mammoth effort, even like by now, to just keep maintaining it. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I think everyone knows uh, that they basically uh, paint the bridge and as mm. soon as they've finished painting it, they start painting it again. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a huge job, you know, that sort of maintenance. They even, uh, I believe, um, developed a special paint for painting the Harbour Bridge as well. Mm. So it's kind of almost like a powder coat. So it goes on as dry spray sticks and, uh, you know, that sped up the job because I don't think it's been something you'd want to be painting with a brush. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to return to one of uh, your earlier points about how they wouldn't make it um, that way today and e even just in terms of uh, visual and structural design, you look at it and I remember the very first time that I sort of laid my eyes on it in like in person, so to speak, and it is a, it's an amazing sort of vista to look at and you can imagine though that with today's modern design that 
that sort of that the feeling that it gives you just visually wouldn't necessarily be there um, in today's modern design. And it's probably right that, well, I'm glad that he's, uh, that Ross Cameron's actually suggesting that um, when they go to replace the bridge, that it, they replace it with something that looks exactly the same. Yeah, I think, look, I think that's a great idea. I, mm. I think it's really important uh, when we think of structures around this sort of age, and this includes the Empire State Building, that they don't build buildings like the Empire State Building. The, that is a very, very heavy building. Mm. And likewise, the Sydney Harbour, because of the lack of technology at the time compared to what we have today, is a very heavy bridge. You know, if you made it today, you would make it out of lighter weight materials. Mm. It'd be stronger, it'd be more flexible and... You also have to remember that when they built that bridge, traffic wasn't like it was. Mm. You know, uh, it didn't have to carry the load of cars or the volume of, of rail. Mm. And so you would actually improve the facilities on the bridge if you if you remade it. I mean, for all those who travel backwards and forwards on the bridge, we also know how much, you know, how, how big it is. And you when you actually drive across it, you see how much iron is actually in that bridge and uh, yes you, you'd certainly make it very differently mm. on another note the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is another amazing uh, architectural feat and uh, I've actually heard uh, people talking about that and if they were to remake that today they wouldn't make it in the same way either mm, absolutely just some stats um, when the bridge was opened uh, New South Wales had a total carpool of 10,000 and a population of 1 million this week <laughs> this week uh, in, in terms of his uh, riding uh, over a million cars will pass over the bridge from a city population of 4.6 million and growing at over 65,000 a year so obviously the bridge no longer can sustain that level of um, traffic and movement and one other thing that um, he he said that was quite interesting was um, the original engineers of the bridge were quite clever in that um, it was almost designed to be taken down as well because they knew at some point it would have to be replaced and there was also a provision in there to put a, um, a second uh, carriageway on the bridge to sustain oh, yeah. to sustain more traffic. Uh, the only reason that second carriageway has never been implemented is because they didn't get around to suggesting it until the 90s. And uh, by that time, the structure had weakened sufficiently to uh, make that not feasible. It wouldn't have been able to hold it. Whereas now, if, as, if they do what Cameron's suggesting here, is that if they put in the new bridge, they just immediately put in the second carriageway carriageway straight away and then they'll have what up to maybe 16 lanes of uh of uh, road and rail that they can have at their disposal it's a great idea and if they did replace it i, I wonder though how long uh this time around they'd expect uh, the bridge to last before they upgrade it again 30 40 years maybe mm. uh if you look at developments you know in nanomaterials and some of the carbon tubes and, and carbon fibers that we have it's quite feasible that in 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 30 to 40 years they'll be able to make a bridge the likes of something we, we can't even imagine today. Probably mm. very much in the same way that, you know, you look at the uh, Baldy Bridge or the um, uh, Westgate Bridge in, in Melbourne. You mm. know, they're, they're completely different to, you know, the Sydney Harbour Bridge and um, you wonder with the technology uh, what it would be like in, uh, you know, another another 20 years or so. And, and you mm. know, imagine uh, carbon tubes that, in the shape of the opera, uh, sorry, in the shape of the bridge that light up, you yeah. know, store electricity, generate electricity. There's so much more you could do with, with something that big with the right technology. Well, I don't know about you, Steve, but I can imagine that image of seeing the uh, new bridge getting sort of clicked in, like he suggests there, would be uh, <laughs> quite an exciting uh, um, sort of uh, moment in history, uh, just seeing it. And also just amazing to watch as well that, you know, they could fabricate this whole thing and just click it into place like a, a Meccano set. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and once again, when we're talking about engineering and things like that, the Boeing Dreamliner, mm -hmm. uh, the 787, is, is another example of where engineering, you know, planes traditionally are held together by thousands and thousands of rivets that you see when you actually get on board. Uh, the Dreamliner is actually uh, segment construction exactly as uh, Cameron's talking about with the bridge mm. and effectively it, it clicks together. So it's actually whole pieces of carbon fibre. It's, mm. it's, that's amazing engineering too. So I think, you know, um, the sorts of things he's talking about are, are not just, you know, say for structural engineering in, in bridges, but, you know, it's the same for buildings and it's actually the same for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the engineered products 
that, mm. that we buy that are large. There's whole new technologies there now and they are changing radically the way, you know, we, we build these structures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let's um, maybe expand this out a little bit. Um, now, uh, you recently uh, uh, went to a forum in relation to uh, sustainable uh, futures and uh, I think we've uh, spoken about this before in terms of uh, the limits uh, to economic growth and just growth in general and uh, the way that works on a, on a planet with finite resources. Now, I mean, I think it's good that the, uh, the Harbour Bridge story kind of came up this week and, you know, this, I mean, it coincidentally kind of ties in because it does highlight how again we mentioned already how they built that bridge before is not the way we could build it now because we know um with the way the materials um that we have available the like elements compounds and whatever else that we need in order to um, make um something like that uh it's not just this you know we can't just go out there continually and plunder all the resources out of the ground to make that happen um what did you um, take out of um, out of this topic? Well, it's, it's quite an interesting topic uh, because you know uh, there are limits to growth. So even though people say there aren't, there are. And mm. we've done a fist chat episode, I think, where they actually calculated that if the growth on Earth, that I think when we spoke about it in two thousand and eleven, wasn't mm. kept going at that rate, we'd need an extra half a planet to supply the raw materials for all the for this mm. exponential growth that's going to continue. So yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting. There are distinct limits to growth and and they can be in the form of a bridge that doesn't service the city as well as it can. And I think that's Cameron's point in terms of redoing the bridge. But there's there's also the, the notion that I think we need to get past as well, which is that uh, we'll always just innovate our way out of it. Mm. That's true. Uh, I think humans are, you know, incredible and we can always work out a way to get around these limits to growth. But the fact is, is that when you're uh, up against the hard end of, uh, you know, resource, um, you know, and not having enough of it, then uh, very often the the ingenious solutions may not always be so pleasant. So, uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, just looking at um, like uh, that uh, link you sent me just in relation to some of the things I was suggesting, you know, the idea of having birth credits. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, a couple will have two, say, um, for two kids. I'm assuming, yeah. um, and uh, you know, they could sell them to others if they want more, and they think that they're not going to use them, or you'd have to buy more if uh, you want more kids. And uh, it's the idea of uh, creating a sustainable population uh, that can't, that isn't continually growing. And it's interesting as well. I think one of the points that was made uh, in, in the course of the discussion was that our economic models are based very much on continuous consumer-based growth mm. and that we need new new economic models to deal with, you know, the changes that the resource limits. So how many people can the world actually carry at a reasonable level above the poverty line? Mm. Uh, you know, how, how many uh, minds have we actually got to build the things? You know, are, are we building the right things? Yeah. And part of that problem is the economic model. So a lot of these interesting, um, I guess, solutions are, are economic-based. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't have kids. You can have up to two kids, which is probably the average anyway. Mm. Uh, if you wanted to have more kids, you could purchase a credit off a couple that uh, didn't want to have, you know, more than one kid yeah. or none kids. So it sounds a bit weird. Uh, you know, I guess uh, monetarizing that right to have children, but it, in the at the end of the day, it actually makes a lot of sense. It would probably work. Mm, absolutely. All right. I just wanted to finish up with this final <laughs> notion that I just saw. Final idea that was brought up here, where they're saying, uh, "Not sure if we've ever had self sustainability ever since we began farming, manufacturing, and exploiting our natural resources," which was quite a while ago, <laughs> and. Uh, um, I think uh, that that idea really get, comes into focus when you think of the last hundred years in particular. It's just yeah. accelerated um, exponentially um, with all of the technological advances and everything else that's come down the pipe. And I think that that just uh, you know sort of summarises uh, some of the things that were mentioned there in, in that particular forum was the fact that we have hit peak oil. Now that doesn't mean we don't have huge oil reserves. We've got huge oil reserves. It's just that we can't tap that supply 
any quicker than we are now. And so that limits, that's that's a resource limit. So it's, it's a very interesting sort of topic when you get into it. And it's probably something if uh, people in Fist Chat land their uh, tweeters, we'll, we'll continue to talk about because it's some very interesting, I think, relationships between the limits to growth and how we will develop as a future society. Absolutely. All right, Steve, we might uh, wrap it up there. So thanks again for the chat. Anytime. I can't wait to see the new Harbour Bridge, Ben. No, I can, we'll, we'll book tickets and uh, sit there uh, and watch them click it in. That's it. <laughs> let's, let's hope no one burns it down with fireworks or something. No, absolutely. <laughs> they still have to put that uh, the, light that symbol up every uh, New Year's, don't they? That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. So that's it for uh, this episode. So we'll catch you next time. <laughs>